if you join for rare, or, you, could, you absolutely could. Yeah. Good, uh, good morning, and welcome to the grand round to the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Virginia. It's my pleasure again to introduce Dr. Sam Selesnick, our visiting professor. Dr. Selesnick is a fellowship trained otologist, neurotologist, uh, is past president of the American Neurotology Society and treasurer of our flagship journal, Otology and Neurotology. He is professor and vice chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Weill Cornell Medical College, and uh, he'll be speaking this morning on the evolving paradigm in the treatment of patients with vestibular schwannoma. Sam, thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you, Brian. So, good morning. Uh, uh, first, uh, introduction to uh, the geography of, of New York. We looked at this a little bit yesterday. This is the Upper East Side, uh, Central Park here, the Seattle, Manhattan. That's New Jersey, where I live, out there in Montclair. Um, and this is uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital and Weill Cornell Medical College in this campus in the uh, East 70s. So, uh, we all know that acoustic tumors are slow growing tumors that uh, most of the time we don't have to worry too much about. That they cause problems, but do they ever lead to uh, threatening intracranial? Uh, issues, they can, uh, but that's pretty rare. Uh, so we want to diagnose these when they're small and take care of them when there's really minimal uh, morbidity involved in their treatment. Now there's many different things we can talk about with regards to acoustic tumors. We can talk about presentation and diagnostic tools, we can talk about rehabilitation of hearing and face. What we're going to work on today is, uh, is the treatment aspect, the acute treatment with um, uh, looking at options including serial observation, primary radiotherapy. When I say primary, I mean as uh, the only mode of treatment, not as combined mode. And when I say radiotherapy, uh, I'm including uh, radiosurgery, stereotactic radiotherapy, gamma knife, LINAC. Those are all different terms to describe focused types of radiation so that patients need to understand that there's no surgery in a radiosurgery and there's no knife in a gamma knife, uh, that everything we're talking about is really focused radiation. And then, of course, skull-based microsurgery. So I don't think any of the residents in the room would have any trouble uh, setting up a treatment plan for uh, this patient. Uh, this patient has a small intracanalicular right-sided acoustic tumor, elderly, essentially asymptomatic, little hearing loss, little tinnitus. I think everybody would probably agree that's something we're going to watch, uh, get an MRI scan in six months, a year perhaps, and then decide how uh, that treatment's going to change uh, over time. Also, I don't think there'd be any controversy with this patient four centimeter tumor, brainstem compression, compression of the fourth ventricle, hydrocephalic symptoms. Um, so a young patient, symptomatic, big tumor, this patient's going to get a skull-based microsurgery. How about everybody else? Everybody else we can decide on the basis of five different parameters. Number one, their age. So we're going to treat someone differently if they're 20 than if they're 80. Number two, the tumor size. And tumor size, um, this should also say tumor size and shape, because some two centimeter tumors are essentially parallel to the uh, brain stem in terms of the long axis. Others are deeply penetrating. They were all two centimeters in size uh, of the examples that I gave, but their shape is different. And for example, with radiation therapy, how much brain stem interface needs to be radiated is important. Number three is tumor location, depth of penetration down the internal auditory canal. If we have a small tumor that doesn't penetrate deeply down the internal auditory canal, that's going to be a patient, and if that patient um, uh, is young and has hearing, that's going to be a patient that we're going to be more eager to do a surgery on because the likelihood of preserving hearing is going to be higher. Hearing itself is important as, uh, uh, as a parameter, and also an underestimated parameter is disequilibrium and other symptoms. So if a patient is 75 years old and is healthy and not on any medicines and is viable and is working and volunteering uh, and has a tumor that is giving them dizziness that is not letting them get out of the house or the bedridden, then that patient is going to be a better candidate for a surgery than, for example, someone that has a similar type tumor but all of those other parameters are different. So this is what we think about. So back to our treatment options. First treatment option is serial observation. Serial ob observation uh, has changed, certainly in my practice lifetime. This is a study from this year from the British Journal of Neurosurgery. If we look at two different time groups, 
By the way, this is from an ANA patient survey. Always have to be a little careful with patient surveys in terms of accuracy of data, but given that um, it is what it is, uh, this is two different time groups, 1966 to 98, and then 98 to 2008. And you look at what percent of patients say that they were observed, and one that uh, is observed in this uh, later group, and we can see that that's much more common. I can tell you that this number is much lower than uh, in reality. Brad, would you agree with that? George, I'm sure I know that I watch at least half of my patients uh, because uh, if the tumor is small and the patient is older, that's the first thing that you, you tend to do. And if there's tumor growth, then you go on to make decisions. Radiotherapy was virtually unheard of in this time period and now is much more common. But you may think the gamma knife is something that everybody gets all the time. And in fact, that's not the case at all. And then a uh, cell based uh, microsurgery is concordantly decreased in frequency. So what is, let's talk about serial observation. What happens to acoustic tumors? This is a study that we published back in 98. Uh, it was a meta-analysis of 571 patients, average three-year follow-up, and we found that about half of tumors grew in this follow-up period. This is a study that I wrote, and I acknowledge, uh, and I think a lot of people that write on this topic, that there are flaws with it. <coughs> Number one, length of follow-up is a problem. Three years, is that actually enough? And that's an average, which means there's some people that were in there that were less than three years. And if tumors grow slowly, then less than three years, they may just, you may not have caught growth. Linear growth, do, uh, do acoustic tumors grow a little bit every day? No, they don't. They grow in a stair-step fashion, where there can be periods of quiescence, then periods of growth. So are we catching the tumor uh, at the right time period? And then back in 98, when we did this, there was clearly an age bias, so that most people that were being watched were older patients it would be considered unethical or um, immoral to watch uh, a young patient with an acoustic tumor, which is still kind of the case, but uh, the question comes up, is the biology of acoustic tumors the same in the elderly as it is in younger patients? And I'm not sure that that's well understood. Uh, perhaps the best study on this is by Nicolopoulos in 2010 from Otology and Neurotology. Uh, he looked at a uh, systematic review of the literature an awful lot of papers, uh, 41 met uh, inclusion criteria. Um, all studies were published recently, no NF2 patients, and looking at everybody across uh, all these different studies found that growth occurred anywhere from six to 73%. Well, that's not very useful. Uh, there's a, a tremendous range. Uh, the median growth for these different 41 papers was about 30%, 38% uh, of growth. So what can we take away from something that's this big and this diverse? Well. Uh, a watch and wait rescan strategy can certainly be justified in some patients. Uh, and the tumor growth is unpredictable, that there's no really good way of predicting tumor growth. One exception may be that intracanalicular tumors may grow a little bit less often than tumors that already involve the CPA. And when you think about that, that doesn't really make sense. The biology of the tumor is not changing at all. It's the same cells that are in the angle and in the IAC. But uh, there is some data to support that. There's also some data to uh, refute that. So can, there can be no growth. There can be a rare growth that is uh, unusual. Uh, most tumors grow in the first five years uh, and may stay stable. And we'll talk about that in a second. And the other problem is that there's no clear indication when to discharge someone from interval scanning. So you're watching them. You're watching them. Is five years OK? Can you stop watching them at five years or seven or 10? And we're doing a study on that. Uh, looking at that for residual acoustic tumors after surgery, and others have published on this as well, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And the other big problem with this study is that there's no hearing data. Um, this is a study that uh, is from the Stangerup group, and they're a group from Denmark. Denmark is a unique country in that it's relatively small, um, it's relatively uh, wealthy, and it has a centralized uh, form of treatment for tertiary care problems. So they have a really good database, uh, and they can afford it, and they keep it up. So that uh, a number of good studies have come from uh, countries of this size and with these resources. And what they found was uh, uh, looking at intra and extramedial growth, that was IAC or with or without angle involvement, that when there was growth, so, okay, so first of all, we're only looking at growing tumors now. The non-growing tumors were being put aside. But with growing tumors, um, growth uh, would occur in 64% of patients of all of the different tumors within the first year. 
a little bit less in the second year, a little bit less in the third year, fourth, and none in the fifth year or beyond. So the message here is when they grow, they tend to grow right off the bat. Not always. So when do you stop scanning? This is a study, which again just came out a year ago, that could be uh, the basis for stopping in five years and following these patients. How about hearing? Um, the hearing is, uh, the, the scale that we use is the American Academy of Neurology Head and Neck Surgery hearing classification, which is based off the Gardner-Robinson. This is speech discrimination score, this is PTA, and I think everyone would agree that this is flawed. In fact, a new system by uh, Gurgel, who is at Stanford and is now at Utah, looking at different um, uh, groups of percentiles of, of hearing, uh, kind of uh, bunching hearing into different groups is really probably a better way at looking at this because uh, group A hearing, uh, which is speech discrimination score of 70 to 100, uh, PTA of 0 to 30, is clearly aidable hearing. Uh, but this is considered a success, A and B. Do you have patients that have 50% speech discrim and 50% SRT that are happy using hearing aids? Probably not. Um, so that, that's not really so much a success. But with that said, we're going to use this as uh, potential success. Uh, and this is probably the best study on that topic, again, from the uh, Danish group. This is the same um, cohort of patients. <coughs> this was published earlier. Uh, and 662 patients in the study, and all of them had at least two audiograms. They had the wait and scan uh, treatment. And what we found, what, or what they found, was that grade A hearing over time was preserved uh, well initially. In other words, they start out with a grade A, and then a year later, 74% of them are still grade A hearing. But by 10 years, only about 50% have retained the grade A hearing. Why is this important? This is important because when we talk about treatment, we talk about observation, radiation, and surgery, and patients often think that there's risks associated with surgery, and there's risks associated with radiation. So let's take care, let's, let's choose the form of treatment that doesn't have any risk, the safe one, which is observation. And what I'm showing you here is that this is not the safe one, that there are risks associated uh, with waiting, and there's a loss of opportunity of potentially preserving hearing in some patients. Uh, one of the, uh, the essential parts of treatment with serial observation is patients have to come back. I don't know what your compliance is like here. Um, this is a different part of the world than New York where people are maybe in and out more or travel or, uh, uh, or maybe a different mindset. But getting people to come back every year over time is a challenge. Uh, how challenging <coughs> is this? The best study I know is from Pittsburgh in 2010 uh, for a wait and scan cohort. Uh, patients. Uh, we're defined as having failed to follow up if they missed a five-year follow-up appointment or half of the prior appointments. 122 patients, most of them are older. Uh, and they found that 43% did not follow up with authors or physicians. Uh, so that means that if you're going to follow these patients and they're not going to follow up, then that's going to pose a problem. Now, uh, the patients that they did reach out to and find uh, and talk to which is maybe half the people that didn't follow up. They found some chose not to, they didn't understand. Um, but basically, bottom line is uh, that can be an issue for a serial observation. So um, this is kind of a dirty trick and something you need to be aware of, especially the residents. So what I gave you was well thought out data by people that were thoughtful investigators presenting their best work. <coughs> Beware the anecdotal case, the, you know, my grandmother smoked for 50 years, she didn't get lung cancer, you know, that uh, type mindset. So this is, you know, one patient that I'm going to show you, uh, but can drive a point home. This is a patient of mine, 67 years old. I saw her in 2002, left side of sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus, MRI, small uh, intracanalicular acoustic. She had no angle component, so just IAC. She also had a newly diagnosed chest lesion. So clearly that's more important. Patient went on to have a thoracotomy for lung cancer. I got a follow-up MRI scan in six months. She's cured of the lung cancer. It was small. Everything's fine. Uh, she got a follow-up at six months here. Lost a follow-up nine, nine years later. She's 76. She has dizziness, headache, and she comes into our emergency room, and that's her MRI scan. So, uh, so again, beware the anecdotal case that 
uh, can there be patients out there that, um, that are elderly, they have small tumors, and, um, uh, and they're not so much of an issue? Well, this is a situation where she had hydrocephalus, she had fourth ventricular compression, 3.6 centimeter angle tumor. She did fine with surgery and the like, but that's a, uh, a scary example. So, number two, primary radiotherapy. Uh, I know here at UVA that is something that is done, um, uh, and, uh, and you are known for your uh, radiation therapy of acoustics as well as other um, uh, tumors, so I'm going to give you some background information that you're all probably familiar with, but uh, in general, the way radiation therapy works for starting at the very beginning, ionizing radiation causes excitation injections of an electron, development of free radical, double stand DNA breaks, and apoptosis. The way it's administered, the definition of stereotactic radiosurgery is uh, exposure of an intracranial target, um, usually with gamma rays or with the photons from a uh, linear accelerator, uh, targeted with beams, can be simultaneous, can be sequential, one at a time beams, uh, 10 to 12, up to 200 uh, beams, all meeting at an <coughs> isocenter. Uh, fixation allows for precision and high radiation doses. Single fraction, uh, stereotactic radiosurgery to me means single fraction, as opposed to uh, this, which is stereotactic radiotherapy or fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy, which can use stereotaxis, usually not uh, pins because it's done multiply on multiple days, <coughs> maybe a mask or a, a, a mouth, uh, a bite plate that is some way to, to give reference in stereotaxis, uh, but give a fractionation, and the fractionation. Uh, if the radiation dose is not administered one time, but it's divided, is there less risk with more treatments? Well, there's also risk of missing the target with each treatment. Uh, smaller doses tend to be administered. There may be increased safety there. So, um, uh, so that there's, a, there's kind of a, a give and take in that area. How do we administer radiation? Uh, primarily through gamma knife. Is that what you have here? Yes. Yep. Uh, so uh, gamma knife, cobalt-60 gamma rays, 201 different beams. Uh, there are limits to the helmet. The helmet will only let go down to a certain level, so getting uh, jugular foramen tumors or, or cervical, upper cervical tumors are uh, often inaccessible. Great accuracy, single fraction only. Uh, we use a Linux system, which uses photons instead of gamma rays. Uh, there's a mobile source, so the beam can you know, radiate an ankle or a head. It can reach <coughs> different areas. Uh, usually 10 to 12 beams are used, not 200. Uh, there's no geometric limits. The stereotaxis is, uh, is excellent, uh, but maybe not quite as good as gamma knife. Also, particle beams can be used, uh, for example, mass ionier uh, at uh, uh, mass general. There's uh, proton beams, which I usually would only send patients for indicated tumors like chondrosarcomas or things that are not acoustics that don't really require particle beams. We use a variant of Alice system. This is an, uh, an example of the mask that we use, which is conformed to a patient's face that helps with stereotaxis. So instead of putting uh, uh, pins in every time, uh, we have a mask. So if we radiate them five days in a row, that's one way to help localize them, among other uh, tools. Uh, the goal as a stereotactic radio surgeon, you know, I, I uh, give radio surgery. I, I observe patients. I operate. So I offer patients all forms of therapy, but as the radio surgeon, uh, I'm not the physicist. I'm not the radiation oncologist. My job is to make sure that we develop a best fit computerized treatment plan by minimizing radiation to areas of concern, brainstem, cochlea, uh, and maximizing radiation to uh, 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 the target. And uh, the way that is done is, uh, if this is the uh, tumor size and this is uh, gross tumor volume, the PTV or planned treatment volume is, is usually a couple of millimeters around that. And this is the 80% isodose line. Our goal is to get 12 and a half gray to this line, which means there'll be hotter spots um, uh, at the depth of the tumor. But we want to make sure that 100% of the 80% uh, isodose line gets what we're planning, which is a 12 and a half gray. So there's the point here being in this uh, histogram is that there should be a, a, a sharp drop off a shoulder uh, when it comes to uh, administering radiation to the tumor but not to anything else. The inverse to that is this, which is the <coughs> uh, histogram looking at, um, uh, looking at brainstem dose. Instead of looking like this shoulder, we want the shoulder to look like this, so there's very little dose that's administered to the brainstem. And that's something that's all calculable and uh, 
uh, in, in something easily defined. Uh, the literature in this area is complicated, uh, and it's. And I promise I won't go through these slides to you because this is. Uh, that would be. Uh, not much would be gained from that, but there are a couple of points to be made. First of all, uh, literature is complicated because these are all patients that had a radio surgery, so they had one session. If we look at fractionated radiotherapy, there can be a number of different sessions, anywhere from five to 30. Going back to radio surgery, different number of patients, total dose is variable, up to 22 gray. Uh, month follow-up is, is variable. <coughs> Clearly, one month after radiation therapy, there's not going to be any change. So including data like that is, is, is problematic. Tumor size is variable. So when we look at, at results, when you look at the endpoint, you really have to look at everything that is done to get you to that endpoint. Uh, the long and short of it, I'm going to uh, jump ahead, is that uh, if we were to summarize those slides and a number of others that I have that are from earlier data, that this is a heterogeneous group with variable follow-up. Uh, but there are some lessons that I think we can take away from this. Number one is that in terms of tumor control, and again, tumor control means tumor's not growing. It doesn't mean the tumor went away. It means that it's not bigger than it was. So it may have shrunk a little bit, may not have, but that's all tumor control. That uh, tumor control uh, with, oh, I'm sorry. I should uh, just point out that the data that I'm showing you is for Linac radio surgery, not Gamma Knife, because that's the system that I use and I talk about most often. But um, tumor control rates are anywhere from 74 to 100%, usually the 90 to 100% range, for single fraction, for multiple fraction, uh, in that uh, similar range. But um, how, about, uh, how about hearing preservation? This is a study that, um, uh, that just came out um, uh, literally this month, September 2013, from General Neurosurgery. Um, from UCSF looking uh, at uh, a number of different articles, coming down to 74 articles they were able to hold, that, hold down as a, uh, with inclusion criteria, almost 6,000 patients, average follow-up around three years. Again, average is a problem, could be a lot less, so hearing might be better, could be more. Uh, but patients that were treated with uh, 12 and a half gray, which is the standard at this point, had a about 60% chance of retaining grade one or two hearing. That doesn't mean they're aidable. Again, with grade two hearing, they may not be aidable. I can tell you this doesn't really jive with my experience and with the experience that I've had talking to other uh, people doing this and that I think this number is high. I think that people that really have retained hearing beyond three to five years that is truly useful is, is, is not high, but this is uh, the most recent published data. The point to be made here is that this is all with single fraction. This, for comparison, <coughs> is a fractionated. And there aren't that many studies that have good hearing data. Um, and these are all fairly recent. You can see the number of patients here. But in general, similar types of hearing data. Here, we look, 167 patients were examined, not 6,000. Uh, but around 5% had preservation of grade one, I'm sorry, 50% had preservation of grade one or two hearing. Other complications, uh, facial nerve, trigeminal nerve, hydrocephalus, long and short is that all of this is rare after um, focused forms of radiation therapy. And when facial nerve uh, dysfunction does happen, it's usually transient, not permanent. Um, and, uh, and there's some numbers that clearly are way out of whack in terms of facial nerve uh, weakness. So conclusion about, uh, my conclusions regarding LINAC data is that LINAC is safe. Uh, I think it's essentially a safe form of therapy. Hearing preservation, I would consider to be fair to good. Uh, tumor control is good, but longer studies are necessary. And that FSRT may not actually be any better in terms of hearing preservation. At our institution, at Sloan Kettering, where I do uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which is uh, our sister hospital in New York with uh, Weill Cornell, um, there we, we began radiating with fractionated uh, with vaccination for about 10 patients, and our hearing results were so bad that we stopped and went back to uh, uh, single-dose treatment. Um, so issues to keep in mind with, uh, with SRS, acoustic tumors don't grow at a linear rate. There's a large variability in the literature, as there is with surgery, by the way. Uh, in general, increasing dose parallels increasing complications. Uh, and control after resection is not actually the same as control after radiation. In some ways, functionally, they're the same, 
but after resection, the tumor's gone, or almost gone, and after radiation therapy, the tumor's still there, and that can be a source of concern for patients. So when I talk to patients about risk benefits and alternatives prior to, to treatment, um, I mention what I consider to be a maximum tumor size, that the goals are different, that severe acute complications are rare, facial nerve results are excellent, hearing we talked about. Uh, balance is an issue. A balance will not improve with radiation therapy, certainly in my experience, so that these patients will need vestibular rehab or will need some other form of therapy, um, even labyrinthectomy or vestibular rectomy or removal of tumor, perhaps. Uh, I do talk to patients about the risk of subsequent surgery, that if we do need to do surgery in the future, the chance of having a facial nerve that's working is definitely lower. There's some data from Pittsburgh that refutes that. Certainly, in my experience, saving the nerve and having it work are two very different things after, um, after radiation therapy. And delayed, a delayed malignant transformation rate is a rarity. I've seen it twice in my career, um, and, uh, and it's a terrible outcome. So finally, the last thing we'll talk, well, not exactly the last thing we'll talk about is skull-based microsurgery. I want to um, uh, just review the, the approaches uh, to the skull base that I know you're all familiar with, include the translabyrinthine, the retrosigmoid, the metal fossa. But I want to specifically talk about um, changes that I've seen in my career uh, with microsurgery. And the three types of changes. There's change in techniques, technologies, and concepts. The techniques have changed some over the past 22 years. Technologies, microscopes are better. Um, cavitrons are probably better. Uh, but the concepts have, have very much definitely changed uh, in that now when we manage large tumors, when I started out, tumors coming out, that was the goal, and we were going to do that, you know, pretty much come hell or high water so that uh, we hurt facial nerves unnecessarily at that time. And over time, we have, we the uh, neurologic and neurosurgical com community have understood that uh, preservation of function with radical debulking of tumor is in the patient's best interest. And, um, and combined therapy is an option. So uh, how do you manage large tumors like this? Uh, one way of uh, uh, treating this is just with irradiation. There can be significant problems just from a dose standpoint radiating these types of tumors where there can be brainstem and cerebellar um, uh, contusion, infarction. So that, that is not uh, realistic. So the question then comes from a surgical standpoint, do we remove all of it or less than all of it? And this is a question that has gone back for not quite centuries yet, but certainly decades, back to the early part of the 20th century when Harvey Cushing, the father of American neurosurgery, uh, was a believer in, in debulking, didn't have the microscope uh, and dealt with very large tumors and outcomes, long-term outcomes certainly weren't good. His student, Walter Dandy, was one that believed that everything came out, even if that was a facial nerve and the anterior inferior cerebral artery at times, everything came out. Uh, and this was a source of rift between these, uh, these two gentlemen who were colleagues and friends, and, uh, and over time uh, very much uh, were not. And uh, it's thought that this is one of the primary reasons that, uh, that that happened. So this debate that we're talking about now is one that's pretty old. <coughs> Uh, large tumors do entail greater risk, uh, you're closer to the basilar, uh, so that if there's arterial injury, which is rare, uh, that would involve larger areas of brain stem. That doesn't come up much. But what does come up much uh, is facial nerve uh, problems. These are all facial nerve studies that are relatively recent, some of them very large, 150, 175, all of them with large tumors. And when we look at facial nerve outcomes in these patients, this is the numbers that we're looking at that are house Brackman grade one or two, 29, 33% for complete removal of tumors. And that's not acceptable um, for patients nowadays or at any time. So the question comes down then uh, for these large tumors, primary ra radiotherapy alone, not a great choice. Total resection, not so great. But near total and subtotal may be a good option with combined therapy of radiation if necessary. So if this is a tumor and we leave a rind of tumor like this, I would consider that to be subtotal. This little shard uh, would be a near total resection. But these patients tend to do quite well in terms of facial function. But how about in terms of, of recurrence? 
first of all, a couple examples of the subtotal resection. This is an example of a near total resection. And one of our concerns is recurrence. This is a study that, from UCSF that goes back to 2003, 50 patients. And what they found was with near total resection, the chance of tumor growing over five years is about 3%. That's excellent. Patients will accept perfect facial function and a 3% recurrence rate. Even with subtotal resection, and subtotal is kind of a, uh, that's kind of a murky term because, you know, taking a biopsy is a subtotal resection. or doing a near, almost near total is also subtotal. So what, uh, you know, how do you define that term? But with subtotal resections, two-thirds of patients didn't recur and can be followed over time, which is also very good. Uh, when we look at a more recent paper from 2011, uh, same deal. Uh, recurrence rates of about a third of patients for subtotal resections versus, in their case, 9% for gross total. So, that, uh, so even with subtotal, that's, uh, that's pretty good. To study this better, a multi-institutional study was put together uh, based out of Stanford. Uh, the initial results were presented at the International Conference on Acoustic Tumors uh, in LA in uh, 2011. And this study was multi-center, prospective, and uh, was intended to look at subtotal and near total, and then look at facial nerve results, and then find out if patients need to be treated further for tumor control standpoint. Uh, these are the uh, centers. We were part of this uh, as well. Uh, all of these patients were adults. All of them had tumors at least two and a half centimeters in size, no prior radiation. This was not randomized. Um, uh, there were comparisons with historical uh, groups. Uh, age ranges, uh, tumor characteristics. One point that I would make is that um, uh, it is important to break down tumors into non-cystic and cystic uh, groups because they behave differently. You would think the cystic tumors would be better behaved, that it would be like popping a water balloon, that take out the cysts and everything comes out. And what actually happens is the cyst fluid can permeate the, uh, uh, the capsule and can lead to a dense arachnoiditis and adhesion, so they're more difficult to remove. So what we found was there were five recurrences uh, over, uh, uh, over this group, one with a gross total, one with a near, and three with subtotals. So that's a fairly, uh, fairly small number. The subtotals did recur a little bit faster at two years versus four years for the near total or gross total. These were treated with SRT or IMRT. They did well with treatment. One patient required radiation and additional surgery, but were easily, uh, well not easily, but were controlled in terms of tumor growth. Uh, but when we look at predictive uh, aspects, there are a couple of su uh, surprising um, pieces of information that I've, uh, that I've found, is that for tumor control rates, the predictor of surgical failure, the only predictor, was if a tumor was cystic. That's what would lead to, uh, to recurrence, not something that you would expect, like the tumor was big or the tumor wasn't resected adequately. So that the degree of tumor resection and the tumor size was not predictive when uh, the biology of the tumor, the way the tumor behaved, is different in cystic tumors than that was predictive of tumor control failure. <coughs> How about facial nerve? Uh, control. Uh, facial nerve results were, in general, excellent. Uh, for gross total, um, actually, let me take a step back and just say there's a little bias here because if there's a gross total resection, the reason that there was gross total resection is that the planes were probably pretty good, that you were able to get a gross total resection so that you would expect the facial nerve to be working a little bit better. Whereas if there was a subtotal resection, the planes were probably not very good, and, and facial uh, nerve results may not be as, uh, or one would want to leave more tumor to avoid uh, facial nerve injury. So gross total, this is at a, this is has Brackman gate one and two, and we can see gross total immediate versus a year uh, is not as good as near total at a year and subtotal at a year. So these are excellent results overall, all comers, 83 percent um, uh, excellent function. Much better than that slide I showed you before in the 30 percent range with the complete resection at all time. But another surprising um, piece of information in terms of being a predictor of outcomes is that here the independent predictor of best facial function was tumor size. Tumor size was not a predictor of tumor control we just saw, but is a predictor of, of facial nerve function. And not predictive is degree of resection for the reason that I just uh, uh, mentioned, that if there was a gross total resection, there were probably better planes and, and it was easier to resect. 
Um, uh, Gurgle also was from Stanford, now is uh, at Utah, uh, recently wrote, this is a, uh, a compendium, a current opinion uh, journal, 2012, looking at other studies and still found that with the subtotal resections of big tumors, that 80 to 95 percent facial nerve uh, excellent function rate is uh, being seen out there in the literature. So what's wrong with our study? The advantage of something like this is that clearly there's better facial outcomes, there's decreased complication rates, there could be a need for radiosurgery, there could be a need for reoperation. Those are risks that the patient has to understand, but I think if you couch that in a way that they can understand, that's clearly a good decision for them. There's no randomization, there's the inherent bias that I just mentioned, most data from a handful of very experienced surgeons, so does that apply to everybody? Maybe yes, maybe no. Degree of you know what I call subtotal versus what they call subtotal in Iowa or in Stanford may be different uh, to some degree. So what we've learned from the first five years is uh, the good facial outcomes, cystic tumors are more of a problem, the, the predictive nature of facial nerve and uh, tumor control problems, uh, and uh, the tumor recurrence might not uh, be a function of the degree of resection. So uh, uh, to close, I, I was a little bit disingenuous with you. When I started this talk, I said there are three ways of taking care of patients with acoustic tumors. In fact, I lied. Uh, there is a fourth way that we should talk about at least for a couple of minutes, and that's chemotherapy, which clearly was not present at the time when I started my training and is still very, very new. But let's talk about what's out there for, uh, for chemotherapy for acoustic tumors because uh, it is being actively studied. The two uh, primary uh, agents that are being used right now, where there's at least some data, is uh, erlotinib, uh, which, was a, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It's, uh, just like the uh, just like uh, lapatinib is used usually for small cell non small cell lung cancer pancreatic cancer very aggressive cancers so that the risk ratio uh, is is favorable in other words giving a potentially toxic drug in someone that has a very poor prognosis is, is something that is FDA approved it, it's right now under investigation for acoustics which are, are different um, and the only data from this is from Plotkin, who has uh, published most on this topic, uh, from uh, Harvard in Otology and Neurotology in 2010. There were 11 patients. Um, uh, they found with this agent, uh, there was no response on, in terms of tumor volume uh, changes. Uh, three patients displayed prolonged stable disease. Uh, some had minor hearing responses. But this was a, not a, a great success, which in contradistinction, this also uh, uh, Avastin, which is the most commonly used agent out there now, um, was also studied by the same group. Avastin is the anti-VEGF monoclonal antibody, uh, again used for very aggressive cancers for the same reason. Uh, the two current clinical trials going on on the clinicaltrials.gov uh, as of today. Uh, the risk with IV infusion, there is a 2% risk of intracranial hemorrhage. So this is, this is a drug that has risk associated with it. So when you choose to use a drug like this, clearly that needs to be understood. It can be given intravenously. It can also be given intra-arterial uh, with, uh, via angiography. And the related stroke rate is about 3%. Again, uh, not insignificant. But with that as background, same author published last year, 2012. Here are the 31 patients. All of these patients had NF2. Um, so that were, were not surgical candidates or had already been radiated. Uh, and they found a radiographic response rate of 55%. So that there was at least 20% decrease in overall tumor volume in over half of patients at three months. And there was no growth in tumor in about half of patients up to three years. So that there was clearly a response. Is this a cure that is long-term? I don't think we can say that, but there has been uh, clear evidence of a response. From a hearing standpoint, over half the patients had significant improvement in their word recognition score after chemotherapy. And that was uh, uh, persistent for up to 14 months afterwards. So that this is an avenue of treatment where there is risk associated, uh, but in selected patients may be of value. Uh, the risks in, uh, in the Plotkin study, there are 168 adverse risks. Risks can be uh, gauged on the basis of levels one through four. One and two are really very minor, IV infusion, uh, inflammation, 
versus three or four. Three is a need for hospitalization. Four is life-threatening. But of these 168 adverse events in 31 patients, there was one life-threatening uh, event. There were eight uh, events that required hospitalization. So that, again, uh, this is, there is risk, but in these patients that have little other choice, um, uh, this may be a very worthwhile risk. We're uh, at Cornell uh, near Presbyterian Hospital, uh, Well Cornell Medical Center. We are doing an intra-arterial study um, uh, for superselective infusion of, of Avastin. When I say this, I don't think we have a patient yet. This is something that's fairly new and would be uh, in very selected patients. But when you look at all of the chemotherapeutic options, if you want to look at everything that's out there on clinicaltrials.gov, there is uh, there's a PTC299. Uh, study that's been suspended. Lapatinib, we're also running out of Cornell. They're running out of NYU, out of uh, the House group. Uh, that's an active trial. Uh, imatinib, uh, pilot studies. There are two studies of uh, Everolimus. So there are a half a dozen different agents that are being uh, examined at this point. So to conclude, uh, we have different options to offer our patients, and we have a, a way of thinking about these patients in terms of defining what those different options are. And, uh, and this has clearly been a change um, uh, in the past 22 years for me, and I look forward to seeing further changes and uh, trying to help our patients better as time goes on. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Great question. The uh, question was, are there times when we don't observe after subtotal resection we go right to, uh, uh, to radiosurgery? No. Uh, and, uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. The behavior, when we go back to the serial observation, the behavior of acoustic tumors uh, are odd in that they are a tumor that can have stair-step growth. There can be periods of quiescence, and that quiescence could be long-term. When we devascularize a tumor, which you clearly don't do completely with a subtotal resection, that can change the biology of the tumor behavior, and there can be periods of, of quiescence that can be indefinite. Um, you can always argue that if you radiate uh, immediately, then you are um, you're being as, as thorough as possible, and that offers the advantage to the patient of not having them or lowering their level of concern. That's an argument that, that I'm so-so with because either way, they're going to have post-operative MRI scans. So they're concerned. They're still going to have a once-a-year, you know, tachycardia, you know, when they go in and they're worried about, you know, did the tumor grow and, and what the, the situation is. So, um, so uh, I think we tend to, to watch most of those patients. George. Sam, that was outstanding. Thank you. Very complex topic, obviously. Um, any insights in how you simplify all of this to your individual patient? That's a that's a great question. That is the art. That's the art of medicine. You know, not the science of medicine. How do you how do you convey something that is that is clearly complex? Well, for, there's different parts of this. Number one is that the, the the physician part, and number two is the patient part, in that patients have different receptive capabilities. That someone that is a very pleasant, well-meaning, you know, farmer that you know just barely graduated high school versus someone who is a, you know, whatever the other extreme would be, uh, has different capabilities to process what you're going to tell them, and can participate in the decision more. Some people say, just tell me what to do. And, uh, you know, I, I trust you and, and the like. And, and I'll still explain my reasoning and how we get to where I think we should be. Um, but it's a partnership in terms of making that decision. And that, uh, you know, making it clear is something that, that we as surgeons or as um, um, or laryngologists need to do. 
Uh, you know, an interesting point is, and this doesn't have anything to do with acoustic tumors, is how we consider ourselves, or we should consider ourselves to be unbiased. We're definitely not unbiased. Um, that we always give cues in our body language and our facial expressions of what we think we should do. We can lay things out, but people are able to look and read you and, and get a sense of what's going on. So I think you have to do as best you can in terms of educating the patient, reading who they are and what they're able to process and what they need, and then coming to you know, a decision that makes sense. It's kind of like, uh, I use the example of like standing at the edge of a cliff and holding hands with the patient and you jump off together. We're doing this together. We're going to decide the best way that we're going to uh, sort this out and you know, see what comes of it. Do the data suggest that observation may be an approach for healthy patients at any age? I mean, if there are patients who, um, you know, in five years have not had any significant growth, that you know, that may be an option at any age. Is that something you offer to patients, or I mean, probably? You know, we don't have enough data uh, of a very long nature, mm -hmm. but in, when you counsel patients, are the, is there an age at which you really don't recommend observation? Yes. Yeah, I think that age, of those different uh, parameters here, the age really does play a role in this. I think the likelihood of having a, even a smallish acoustic, a one centimeter acoustic in a 25-year-old, the li likelihood of that behaving well over you know, five decades is really unlikely. Uh, and like you say, there's no data to back that up, but there's certainly a lot of data in terms of how these tumors grow over years or a decade or two. So that I, um, I tend to treat, if the tumor is very small, like a two or three millimeter dot in the IAC, and there's a little bit of hearing loss, certainly I'll watch that. But if there's a tumor that is, you know, out of the IAC or, um, or, for example, is, is fairly favorable, doesn't penetrate deeply down the eye, see the hearing is, is quite good, that's an opportunity that you would want to operate on a patient like that if they were young, and you wouldn't <laughs> if they were older. What is, whether it's observation after subtotal resection mm -hmm. or just observation of a de novo acoustic neuroma, what's your time interval for serial MRI. Great question. We are setting that right now. I'm, I'm, I'll be looking at the data when I get back at the, at, at the end of the week, and there's been some data that's already published on that. Uh, and, and it's widely divergent, so that I, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the answer to this is, because I, I, I get too many MRI scans on too many patients. And you talk about um, uh, cost effectiveness in the practice of medicine. This is a rare tumor. MRI scans are expensive. And if we're trying to, you know, keep um, you know, the cost of health care below 20% of our GDP. I mean, this, this has a role in that. So how often do you get this? The, the one study that people refer to, which is fairly uh, recent, is Colin Distrell's uh, study from the Mayo Clinic, where they have, in their post-operative scans, if there is only linear, you break down linear and nodular enhancement. If there's a little bit of linear enhancement, um, and the, the surgeon believes that there was a gross total or near total resection, their recommendation, I think, if I remember correctly, is a follow-up in seven years. I get one in six months. So that there is a, a huge difference in terms of uh, the cost that's involved with that. Uh, and I get that, I tend to get them yearly after that for the reason that these are unpredictable in terms of their behavior. When do you stop? When is it okay? When are you out of the woods? We don't really know that. Uh, some of this plays into, yes, there's a medical legal aspect of this. Uh, but it really is what's best for patient care, and, and that's a question that I don't have a good answer to. I think I get too many MRI scans. Do you have any further recommendations for the management of a cystic tumor? You mentioned briefly about its risks in surgery. How does it respond to radiation? Great question. Unfortunately, the same as with surgery. So the complication rates are higher with radiation, um, with, with cystic tumors and non-cystic tumors. The surgical complications for complete resection uh, are higher with cystic than non-cystic. So that it's a little bit of a conundrum. You know, a lot of the core of the, of the tumor is already fairly necrotic in these cystic tumors. So radiating them is not, you know, is, is not really getting um, the, the problem at hand. Uh, with that said, still most patients with cystic tumors are managed very effectively through surgery uh, plus or minus radiation. But, um, Certainly from the surgeon's standpoint, it is a much more frustrating problem when you're kind of pl 
pulling up on the, the rind on the brain stem and, and the brain stem's kind of coming up with you. There's no, there's no plane and you just have to at that point stop and realize that you, uh, you really want to do no harm. So all comers, give us an idea of the percentage that you observe, radiate, and surgery, regardless of age, tumor size, just all comers. Well, um, uh, I will answer that question, but it's biased because of what I do and where I practice, that most of the time, that if they're coming to see me, patients kind of have an agenda about what's going to be happening. So it's not as if it is a totally unbiased, random uh, group. Um, I would say that I observe it for sure more than half uh, as initial form uh, of therapy. That if a tumor is sizable, again, with these different parameters, uh, younger patient or is sizable even an older patient, then they're more likely to get surgery. The patients that, that are the first ones to get radiation are patients that have relatively asymptomatic, relatively small tumors that are growing. So that I've watched them, they're starting to grow. Patient 72 has a little bit of hearing loss. That's somebody I'm clearly going uh, to go ahead and radiate. Other questions? That was a scholarly mm -hmm. review. Thank Great, you very thank much. You. My pleasure. I want to also thank the American Neurological Society, the American Neurotology Society, the Department of Otolaryngology here at the University of Virginia, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Well, we got another lecture. Right, but we're not going to tape that one. Yeah, this oh, is this is webinar. Good day, Mimi. <laughs>